Hi everyone, this is Ernie Svensson. Welcome to this session on practice management software. Our special guest and presenter today will be Craig Bayer, a really good friend of mine. Craig is somebody that I've known for a number of years through the American Bar Association uh, Technology Conference in Chicago, but uh, also because Craig works and lives here in Louisiana, I get a chance to spend a lot of time with him. And Craig is uh, very knowledgeable about a lot of things involving technology, specifically legal technology. And one of the things he does is help lawyers figure out what practice management software to choose, uh, how to install it. He'll install it for them. He's a consultant who does installations and also uh, initial training. So uh, Craig is, um, is going to give us a little talk today about um, how to choose practice management software, what practice management software is, how it can help lawyers, and then he's also going to do a short demo using perhaps one or two of the practice management software tools that he uses. So with that, I will turn it over to Craig. Thanks thank for being you. with us, Craig. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Um, I got started installing practice management software in law firms around 2001-2002. I was working at a courier at a law firm, and they bought a whole bunch of software, and I guess they were like, well, you're the slightly nerdy, overweight guy, so <laughs> please um, set it up for us, and I had no idea what I was doing at all. I didn't know what uh, trust accounting was. I didn't know what practice management software was, and I just read a lot of manuals and figured it out, and mm -hmm. uh, I've been doing that at law firms ever since. Right. And you install different kinds of practice management software, too, so it's not just one kind that you install, right? Right, and I re really want to break practice management software down into three different things because I, I get this all the time. I'll get an email or phone call, and I think, you know, there's a lot of confusion, and it, it's it's because it's confusing. So right. because if you buy a, a, a software package like, let's just say, Clio, it's got some aspects of, well, it's got total aspects of front office, but then it also has some billing functionality, and it's got some document management functionality, but it doesn't have any accounting functionality. Right. So it, it's got, I've kind of broken this down into three different things. So the front office is, you know, managing your contacts, your calendars, your to-dos, and being able to see everyone's contacts, calendars, and to-dos, and being able to link that all back to a file. Your back office is your time tracking, your billing, and your accounting. And then there's this DMS aspect as well, or document management software, which actually manages documents and emails. And so the confusing part is, is that there's a lot of different software out there, and they all do certain aspects of this, but they don't all do all of them. And some of them are strong in certain areas, and some of them are strong in other areas. Um, but it's, it's just a mix of stuff. But if you if you talk about practice management software, I really think these are the three key ingredients that you're looking at. Now, the other thing I would add is if you're starting a firm from scratch, whether you just got out of law school or you're, you're, you're merging with a couple of people, the first thing that you're going to get, no matter what, is the back office software because you have to be able to um, bill clients to receive money. So everyone starts off with some sort of back office software. Uh, PC Law, Tabs 3 are, are really common around the country. In, in smaller law firms, I mean... And, and PC Law and Tabs 3 are types, those are specific um, software for practice management. We'll, and we'll get into those in a little bit, right? Right, but, but yeah. for like 30 users or less. But if you were to buy any of the, if you were to buy that, so you, you started out a law firm, you need to be able to send someone a bill, you need to be able to create a tax return, you know, you need to be able to do payroll, you might buy PC Law. Or, or tabs three, but they also have front office components and document management components as well. Right. So, Why don't you talk to us about what PMS is? You know, PMS, mm -hmm. what practice management yeah. software is, which the abbreviation is PMS, and and explain right. to us how that works. Right. So, so the idea here is, again, it's software that allows you to see every phone call, every document, every email, every time entry, 
every expense entry, all in one place. So you just have to picture that you're opening up a filing cabinet and you're, you're going to a Manila folder where it has the case information and all the records of phone calls, emails, documents, time entries, everything is in there. And that is traditional front office software. Right. And really the easiest thing to do is just to jump in and kind of like look at a file and kind of see that. Okay. So if, if I go and I'm just going to open up Google right here, and I'm going to use Clio, which is a really good practice management software. And if we're looking at this right now, this is a case that I'm working on. It's an LLC formation. This is a, a demo case that I've set up. And it's got some information right here on, you know, what's the case about. But a really important stuff is if we scroll down, we can see all the contacts that are on this case. We can see all the to-dos that we have to do for this case. And, and contacts, would, contacts would be like other lawyers who work on the case, the client, people that you need to get in touch with as you work on the case, right? Exactly. Witnesses, it could be anyone. Okay. And this is, and all those contacts are being pulled from a central contact repository. So that's that's the other thing. You know, if you're using right now, you're using Outlook or you're using Gmail or Google Apps. You have your own contact database, but that's really mm -hmm. just related to you. Right. A, a good front office software is going to have a central contact database that everyone can go to, everyone can add to. And then when you have a case that you're working on, you can just choose people and attach them to that case. Right. Okay. So Great. That would be the contact part. The task part would be to-dos. You see here, I have to call this client. I have to create an engagement letter, and these all have a date, and they're assigned to me. But you could also really see, I mean, again, this is just not my to-do list. It's everyone's to-do list for the firm related to this case. For the people, so in other words, the lawyers who are working on this case, when they log in, they'll be able to see their to-dos in there, and they'll be able to see anyone else's to-dos that is working on the case as well. Exactly. Okay. That's useful. And then calendar, same thing. You can calendar events and have a shared view for that. Correct. So, again, I mean, the idea is that anyone could, like, you know, maybe you've never worked on this case before, but you can just walk into it and see what's going on. Mm -hmm. If someone schedules something for you, it's going to show up on your calendar, and everything synchronizes now. So you talk about the calendars here. It's not just here. I mean, I'd be worried if it was just here. Because if my assistant assigned this court date, uh, you know, am I going to go to each, you know, case and see what I have? But that's not how it works. It gets added here. It also gets added to your personal calendar. It gets synchronized with your Droid or iPhone or BlackBerry. Right. It gets thrown all over the place. Right. But you can't do this. You can't in Outlook right now open up, you know, the Craig Bader case and see all the calendar events. You can just see all the calendar events. So right. So in other words, in your personal calendar, it's just going to compile everything from every case, which is good because you need all that in your per you know your personal calendar, your Outlook calendar, your iPhone calendar. But it's also going to keep it segregated according to the matter um, here in this view that we're looking at right now. Correct. Okay. Well, what about notes? So notes would be like things, if you're on the phone call talking to somebody, something important happens, you keep track of it and make notes about the case and other people who are working on the case can kind of see what's going on. Is that, is that what notes are about? It could be for whatever you want. You can just see that I can I can type in here. The, the idea really with notes, um, conceptually I know how a lot of these companies came up with like why do we need a notes field is if you... Um, see sticky notes like attached to files and you see mm. them attached to people's monitors and stuff like that and attached to documents. This is the same thing. So it's a place to just jot down some sort of random idea about the case and you right. can just have it attached there. Right. Yeah, I mean I, I would see that this as incredibly useful for when you're talking to opposing counsel or you're talking to the client and you just sort of have a running record of Things that needed to that came up, the information you had gathered, what was discussed, 
And then I guess it would be great, you know, if you have these notes, then to quickly go, okay, let me go ahead and build for that time. Or maybe at the end of the day, you run through and see, you know, what, what notes did you create. And if every note you create is something that related to time, you could just, you know, enter your time based on the notes and the emails and things like that, right? Yeah, I mean, there's a actually an add time button right here. Mm -hmm. um, you could also print these out if you need to as well. Mm -hmm. But it's just, a, I mean, again, it's just a place to jot things down. And then, so I, me I just mentioned email. Does email integrate into this system as well? Like, can you, so can you send emails in here or manage emails within here? A absolutely. So there's a couple ways that happens. Um, if you're using Outlook, usually there's some sort of integration path there. I'm just speaking generally now, not mm -hmm. clearly. Right. But if you're using Microsoft Outlook, everyone has a plug in there. So if I see an email, I can hit the plug related to this case, and it gets added on here into basically my communications tab right here. I can also usually have something like email communications directly to this matter. So each matter has an email address. And so if you just have that as one of your contacts, you can just email email communications. Right. And so there's a variety of ways of doing it. But you, usually there's some sort of integration with Gmail or some sort of integration with Outlook, and they usually have a way that you can create an email address for a particular matter. It's just right. something to do. So, so this is Clio, and this is an online service. This is software you log into. This is not something that's on your computer. You log in in order to use it, and you can log in from a computer, an iPad, or an iPhone, I take it. Correct. Great. Jumping down the list, time entries. So I can create a time entry here, and I could then create a bill from this time entry. Same thing where I could track client expenses. Again, we're, we're looking at Clio, but this is the same thing in Amicus, Practice Master, Time Matters, um, Rocket Matter, My Case. They, right. they all have the same functionality. This is the they're, just, they're, they're just going to look a little different, but they're going to basically do the same thing. Exactly. And then you can manage documents as well. Correct. So I can just upload documents here. Um, again, this is where it gets a little confusing because it also bleeds over. So I actually have my Clio linked with Net Documents. Mm -hmm. So Net and Documents is just a document management software. Um, but basically, what will happen is you might come to the conclusion after using a practice management software that the document management capabilities are not enough for your firm. Mm -hmm. And usually that happens, let's just say, after you've gotten to maybe over three users or you've been in practice for three years. Right. You, you'll run into some limitations there. And so then you can either deal with it and keep using the, the document management that's built in, or you can move to a traditional document management. Software. And Net Documents is a tradition. Well, it's traditional in the sense that it's a full-blown document management system. It's a little different than what used to be the traditional ones because it's a cloud-based service like Clio is. Correct. Right. But it it definitely has an integration built right. into it, so I can link there. And that integration works pretty well. Yes. So I can go in and, you know, I'm looking at net documents and I can open up documents, save them. It works extremely well. Okay. Great. Well, that's well, that's a great... So is there anything else we need to cover yeah. in here? One, one thing real quick. So I go into add a communication, also phone calls. Oh, right. Okay, so I think this is really, really important for two reasons. One is that we can create a time entry off the phone call. And the other one is that we just log the phone call so you know... Um, you know, did my assistant talk to this person? You know, I've been out of the office the whole day. Um, I go log in, see, I'm like, oh yeah, they recorded a phone call at this point in time. So, okay, so, that's great. so they all have that ability to, to, to have that as well. I think your phone's ringing. Yeah, Speaking of phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, actually, to, to, to even add to that, um, we could also... Um, with some of these systems, like I know Clio has it, you could have actually, if you have a phone call, like if you have a contact in the system and you highlight a phone number, it will dial it for you and then it will open up the screen to record. Oh, that's useful. That's great. 
So that just depends on what what system you're using and what sort of phone system you have. But right. you have all that ability. Right. And this is the kind of thing you help lawyers figure out. You go in there and look at all this and say, here are your options. Here's what you, here's the phone system you have. Gee, that will integrate in this way, and this is great. I'll set it up for you, right? Correct. And th there's there's no answer. I mean, there's you know, what should I recommend? Well, really, we kind of have to talk with the firm and find out what do they need. Right. Then, yeah, this is this is one of those. I, I tell lawyers this all the time that you know some things when they ask me. You know, is there going to be a clear answer to, you know, if I want to be paperless and I want to get a scanner, it's like, yeah, I get the Fujitsu scan snap. That's easy. Every, you know, it's the standard answer. works for everybody. But when it comes to practice management software, it seems to me that this is one of the really tricky things to recommend to people because if they're starting from scratch, you know, they have more flexibility. But if they already bought, you know, one thing and that's something it has to integrate, now it limits what you can pick plus depending on their size or their practice area or what they're trying to do, it seems like it's a really tricky thing to recommend this kind of software to people, even if they're starting from scratch, but especially if they're not. Oh, it, it is, and it, I think you hit the nail on the head about the integration. Like, if you started a, a law practice off, you have some sort of billing and accounting software. Mm -hmm. You have to. So does that integrate with your practice management front office side? or not, and that will limit your options unless you want to change the whole thing. Right. So these are some of the choices. These are not all of them, I take it, but these are some of the popular ones, right? Right. Clio, my case. I, I, we're talking about front office now. I put PC mm -hmm. Law in there because it has the front office capabilities that we just went over. Practice mm -hmm. Master, uh, Amicus Attorney. One of the things to really discuss is, is price. So I'm just going to throw out some pricing so people know what they should expect. So an amicus, time matters, practice master, they're all the same. Really, I should just change this to on-premise. Mm -hmm. You're looking at $999 for the first user and around $699 for each additional user. But that's a one-time cost, theoretically. That is a one-time cost, and then you own the software. Right. And so you own it. And then... Clio is $65 a user per month. My case is $39 a user per month. Let's just say that that price for the cloud-based front office is going to run you anywhere from $30 to $80 a user. Okay. Per month. And you just have to keep paying that fee. Right. And the thing about getting... one of the, I guess one of the advantages of... Um, a subscription model, even though people will say, well, over time I'm going to be paying more, you might not be paying more because by that time, you know, the other, the, your, the desktop software will need to be upgraded, you'll have to pay for an upgrade, and the people who make the desktop software are always looking for ways to add features to make you want to buy the upgrade or else you have to buy the upgrade to keep the integration with other stuff going. So it's, it's the subscription model, while it may seem more expensive, in one way, it's really probably not, and also your de the person who's putting out the, the, the software, the Clios, the my cases, the Rocket Matters, they're de-incentivized from trying to create upgrades that aren't really meaningful. I mean, they're just going to add things that actually need to be added and keep things running smoothly because that's you know that's they're going to get their money either way, and they don't want to annoy you and, and trip you up, right? Is, is, did I say that correctly? Absolutely. And just just to show you here, there is the support or maintenance plan um, can run you, and this can be per user. So Clio, uh, Rocket Matter, Avalogix, my case, there is no maintenance plan. You're just paying mm -hmm. that that one fixed cost. The other thing I would say is if you're starting out, uh, if you're buying five users of Clio, well, that's just going to be you know five times sixty five a month. If mm -hmm. you're buying five years of Amicus, you're going to have to have that cash on hand to pay that, and that's going to be a lot more. So it, it is somewhat helpful for people just starting off. And the Clios and the Rocket Matters, I know one of them does this, or maybe, or maybe they all used to do this, is after you have a certain number of users, they drop the per-user price if you get to a certain threshold, right? Or do I they not do that? 
Rocket Matter did that. Clio doesn't. Clio is okay. sixty-five dollars a user. Okay. The, the, the pricing. Uh, I would say this too. So, like going back to this pricing, is the pricing does change. So that's something to think about. Um, if you're going to like, invest with like Clio, what happens? You know, what is your contract? So usually you might sign a three-year contract that fixes you in. Uh -huh. um, but if you're month to month, they decide to change the pricing. Um, you're going to have to maybe pay that price. In. So when Clio just because Clio was used to be like forty nine dollars per user per month up until less than a year ago, right? So they grandfathered everyone. Even if you so even if you were month to month, you got that old price. Right. Okay. So that's right. another thing is that when you once you get in, usually they do, it seems like most of these services do grandfather people in when they bump up. So that's an advantage to getting in on these services early. Like my case now is thirty nine dollars per user per month, but three years from now as they become more popular their prices will probably go up. Oh I know I know I know people I can use Clio as an example that like hold on to an account um, or they get someone to give them their account you know like oh my dad's about to retire but he has a Clio account like move it over into my name so mm -hmm. I still get that, that right. price. Um, that actually happens. Right. Okay. Cool. And this is kind of some of the stuff that we talked about, um, you know, hosted or set hosted, which means that you have it um, hosted at someone's data center. That's becoming more and more popular, and, and quite honestly, um, is probably going to be the most popular going forward. So it's going to be more likely that you have a hosted solution than you have something in your office. So, ho so hosted. Let's explain hosted really well. So, software as a service is Clio in my case, where you log in, you're using the software uh, through a live internet connection, and uh, you're using the same thing that everybody else uses. It's all the same. A hosted solution, as I understand it, is is kind of a hybrid between traditional. Okay, I've got a server of my own that I have to buy and I have to do all the stuff with it and keep it up, but instead of doing that you have it hosted by somebody. So you're hosting your server somewhere else or sharing a server somewhere else. So you, it's not full-blown SAS or SAAS, but it's more. It's kind of like a hybrid between you having all that stuff, all that equipment on site, except you don't. So you're saving a little money because you're sharing that resource with other people and so forth. Is that basically how hosted works? Right. And so, for example, let's just say that you wanted a meekest attorney but you don't want to have a server in your office. Very doable to do that. So you could go to like Amazon Web Service, mm -hmm. Microsoft Azure, um, and there's a lot of companies out there that will basically rent you that server. So then so you're paying that cost, and then you can put the software on there, and you can definitely do that. And, and the reason that you would want to do that Again, like there's no fixed answer here on what software is best for you. It really depends on your needs. Mm -hmm. and really, you and your firm should take a demo of the software and kind of figure out if you like it or not. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the same thing, you know, a, a, a car will get you to one place. All the cars do the same thing, but right. people have their personal preferences. Right, gotcha. The one, the one thing I would add, and this is, you know, I'll probably in six months just take off the last line here. Um, is young in their product cycle, so less features, which is true, um, but it's becoming less and less relevant. So, like Clio in my case, or about five or six years old, and Practice Master and, and Amicus are 20, 25 years old. So that software does have a lot more features. Yeah, like I've heard one of the things, and I've used Clio, and I, and I like them. And when I, so when I was practicing, I used Clio. But one of the things, the complaints I heard about Clio this wasn't my complaint, but a lot of lawyers would say, well, the reporting features are kind of spartan, and they wish that there were greater reporting features. And I assume that they are constantly adding to the reporting feature, but that's an example of that wasn't a priority in the early phases of Clio. So, you know, there's trade-offs, and you have to know what the trade-offs are. And, and if something matters to you and Clio doesn't offer, you need to see if my case or Rocket Matter does because they don't all... Um, develop at the same rate with the same features. Right. And you just, you really, you just have to, the only way you find that out is kind of make a list of stuff that you're looking for mm -hmm. and then see if see if those products can do it. The one thing I want to say that you really want to be 
careful about is make sure that the software that you choose is what we call browser agnostic, so it will run on anything. Um, right. There is some software out there, um, that, or just real, well, I'll, let me put it this way, is that most cloud-based software is browser agnostic, but you don't have the full functionality in one browser that you have in the other. Well, I think a lot of lawyers can relate to the idea of using the federal court system and PACER. And I don't, again, I don't know today, or by the time people view this, if they view it later, um, you know what it'll all be like. But PACER has is has been notoriously picky about what browser you use to access it, and Mac users particularly find that there are some issues. So yeah, you know, browser agnostic means it works the same no matter what browser you're using, and these these tools. I'll do that, unlike Pacer. <laughs> right. Again, we, we've kind of covered most of these points. Um, the one thing I, w I will say is if you're looking at going with a cloud-based solution, you need to have something that's called uh, data escrow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that could mean two different things, but you want to ask. Again, most of these cloud-based softwares or companies are new. Um, and so they might not be as financially stable as maybe some more um, experienced companies. Again, you just if you're going to put all your data in there, you want to be able to, one, get your data out. So if you decide you don't like the software, you have to have some sort of export capability. Right. And the other thing is that you want to say, if this company goes out of business, do they have a data escrow policy in place? That means the company is paying something like an insurance policy to someone else that if they shut their doors tomorrow, that other company is going to take the data and make it available for a certain period of time. Right. And those are important questions to ask. The lawyer should ask those questions of pretty much any cloud provider. Like, what happens to my data if you go out of business or if I want to access it if you're down or whatever? And that's, you know, that question needs to be asked of every cloud provider. In general, it seems to me the Clio's and the My Cases and the Rocket Matters, those folks are um, going to have an answer for that. They they're going to deal with that. Uh, so they they all provide an escrow uh, data. I would imagine the the question and the where the rubber hits the road is if they actually do go out of business or you decide you want to try to export that data into something else. How how transportable is that data? Like, is it just like well, here's a mishmash of, you know, you can actually search it, but you can't get it up and running somewhere else, or is it pretty easy to take, like, say, a whole Clio system that you have, and you say, oh, I want to go to Rocket Matter. You know, can you import that stuff into Rocket Matter and, and make it usable? Is that realistic? Yes, it's realistic. Okay. And vice and you, versa. And you help people, you've helped people do this kind of thing before? Right. I mean, I, I, can, I can speak more to Clio uh -huh. because I've just dealt with them. More, but and I can speak to stuff like Amicus Attorney and, and Time Matters. Those are a lot easier, Amicus and Time Matters, because they're on a server, mm. so we can get into their database and pull the data out. Okay, that's but, good to know. But Clio will let you export everything out as what we call CSV or mm. comma separated value files, which in really is just like a whole bunch of Excel sheets mm. with all your data in them. So you can export all that stuff out. Great. Um, through Clio. I mean, it, it, it can be exported out, um, and, it, you know, you really, you have to put it into something else. Mm -hmm. So the expectation won't be like, well, I'm just going to stop using this, and I'm just going to have these sheets of data. No, you need a, you're going to need to buy something else or import it into Outlook, and you're not going to have all the functionality. But you have to ask that question because, you know, we mentioned Rocket Matter, Clio, in my case. Those are some really good companies. There's some really bad companies out there. Right. And, you know, because it's the Internet, it's really hard to tell. I mean, they have a good website. Looks, everything looks good. So you really need to ask that question. I mean, it goes to that whole data ownership issue. Is if I'm going to put all my data in here, you know, who owns that data? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we, we've gone over this, you know. But Cleo, I, I, I'd see... I see more people moving to Clio and my case in the front office. That's uh -huh. that's the trend right now. That's the most popular out of all the software um, out there. And again, when I started this business, 
in you know, 2001, 2002, all we were doing was installing in-premise practice management software. And that's becoming rarer and rarer. In-premise is a, is a specific name of a software? Or no, no, no. It, by in-premise, that's a kind of a geeky term, but like the software is at the office. Like it's oh, in software. other words, Amicus and Time Matter are what you would call in-premise software. Right. On-premise because they're... On-premise, got it. Okay. And, and so that, I mean, we just don't re do as much of that anymore, but we do a lot of Clio, in my case, migrations and setups and stuff like that. So that's, that's the current trend, and that's going to stay that way. Okay. All right. Well, what about back office software? Yeah, so this is the accounting stuff. Um, it, it, QuickBooks was probably the most popular, but it's got some issues, uh, and we'll go over those. There's time slips. Zero is becoming more and more popular. Tabs three, and I've added in here PC Law. So I can just speak right now. All the front office software that we talked about all integrate with QuickBooks because it's used so much. Mm -hmm. So if conceptually, if you think about it, if you're in Clio or my case, or even if you're in Amicus or Time Matters, and you create a time entry you can move that time entry or that invoice into QuickBooks to bill it out. So that's how the workflow works. It's the same thing with like a, a time slips. So you create the time entry in Amicus, and then it gets moved over to time slips, and time slips is the product that actually creates the bill. Right, so you generate your bills using this software. Correct. Now. You can generate your bills using Clio. Mm. You can't generate your bills using Amicus. So again, all the software is a little different here. So mm. Clio does have that ability, but Clio doesn't have the accounting functionality. So even if you're creating the bill in, in Clio, you really need to have the integration with QuickBooks so that an invoice is created and there's an accounts receivable, and then that invoice gets paid and then eventually you can do a tax return. That's why the integration is built right. in. Right. And so, and so we have PC Law here, which is a traditional legal billing and accounting software. PC Law actually has an integration with Clio. So you can create the time entries in Clio, and then they get posted into PC Law where the bill is created. Right, it, and... And then, like, an important thing for lawyers is trust accounting as well. And I know that Clio has a function where you can you can handle um, funds received and so forth and manage that within Clio because I've used it. Um, and I guess that's – so I assume these, these software all have to have that kind of functionality too, right? Correct. And I, I think the, the, the issue with QuickBooks and, and maybe even Xero – is that legal specific accounting software makes it harder to commit malpractice. Mm -hmm. And because they have, uh, there's an actual in PC law, and in Clio, there's a trust accounting functionality built into that. You know, so it knows what a trust account is, and you can only do certain things, you can't do other things, and the right. rules are built into the program, and you just don't happen to get that with QuickBooks. Right. So, and I mean, really, just to, uh, just to, to jump in, because this is an example of PC law, but I have a trust section here. Mm. And it's just related to trust, and I, you know, I can't do a trust to general transfer unless I have the an ability to do that. So it just won't let me transfer money. Where in QuickBooks, I can move money around any way I want. But, right. But it, but in it's something like PC law or tabs three, you know. Clio, we have to have a, a specific reason that we can move that money. Or right. Okay. That's good to know, obviously. Yeah, I, I'd say, you know, the idea, I mean, I know that if I were purchasing something, I'd want something that was just completely integrated. Mm -hmm. uh, but there isn't anything that's completely integrated. Um, I mean, there's products that advertise like they are, but they don't. So you have to do this integration. You have to to link it with something. So again, Clio will link with QuickBooks. It'll link with PC Law. 
Amicus will link with time slips. It'll link with QuickBooks. Um, you have a lot of different options there. Really, the way that this usually works is you figure out what sort of billing and accounting software you have, and then I give people a list of options of what will work. Right. All right. So what else do we need to know? So the we DMS software. Over, yeah. So we went over the first. The first two parts um, were the front office and then the back office. And I spent most of the time on the front office because that's really when we talk about practice management software. That's probably the most important area. But the the other area is going to be the document management capability. And so when I get a phone call from someone in the last, you know, I, I need some practice management software. And then I'm like, okay, well, do you have an issue with calendaring? Not really. Do you have an issue with a contacts database? Not really. Do you have an issue finding documents? Yes. So if, if that is really your issue, you probably want to look at a traditional document management software, and that's all it does. So what people t what people typically do it seems like or it's is the solo lawyers and the small firm lawyers they'll 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 make use of the built-in folder structure and file naming system and they'll create sort of a simple file naming system and document management system because th they don't really need a whole lot of extra bells and whistles and that's built in. The problem happens when if you have a couple of different people in your office that are accessing those files either a couple of them don't follow the strict guidelines for how you name the files or they, or they don't put them back you know, in the folders or they don't put them in the folder to begin with. So that's one problem is the, the mayhem factor. And then you mentioned that the ability to search the documents is key and find things within the documents. So a DM, DMS software provides um, discipline and, and orderliness to the files and prevents chaos, and then it also allows you to do more robust searching. Is that basically, um, you know, what a DMS system allows you to do? Correct. And you know, just to add to that, if you were looking at some literature of a practice management software, they are all going to say, and if you call their sales reps, they're all going to say, "Yeah, we do document management." Mm -hmm. But they really do the document management that you just kind of talked about. That's a folder structure document management. Um, their software might just create the folder for you, so you don't have to create it. But mm -hmm. it's still the same issues where you have to rely on someone to choose to use the system, um, and you still have all those issues. So document management is usually the last thing put into place at a law firm. Um, and, and again, what happens is firms either outgrow the document management in their software, their practice management software, like they say, like, you know, we love Clio, we want to keep using it, but we need something else to handle our documents because we've gotten too big. Mm -hmm. So at that point, they'll look at going to something like World Docs or Net Documents, and that's th th those are really the the big players in there. Mm -hmm. Autonomy is the one that used to be called iManage, right? Yeah, I've just given up figuring out that company has been bought and sold so many times. I know they've changed it. That's the that's what we used when I was at the big firm, and it has been interesting to watch all the name changes. But that one used to be the dominant player. World Docs seems to have occupied that that position now. At least if you're going to run servers and all that kind of stuff, it seems like most law firms opt for World Docs now, unless they want cloud-based solutions, which Net Document seems. Um, perfectly positioned to capture. Right, yeah, and, and that's really how, how it's going. I mean, iManage is going to be a much larger firm. We're talking about 300 users and above. Mm. Other than that, you're going to run into World Docs and that document right. if, if you're going to. Really, the one thing that I look at, when it, this is the question that you want to ask. Um, are you an open-ended or closed-end document management system? And so what, what does I that mean? mean? What does that mean? So what I mean by that, and if, if you see on the slide right here, I'm in Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. You see, I go here and I click on Save, and the document management software comes up. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when you go to save the document, or the same thing where if I went to open the document, so if I go to open the document document management software comes up. So it's forcing you to use the document management software. Correct. And that's closed-ended? That's closed-end. 
So Which, actually, a better word would be mandatory. <laughs> mandatory use. Yes, because yes, because I know like closed-minded. So maybe that, but right. that, but, but that is the actual terminology. Right. That's, that's the question that you want to ask. You know, is okay. So whatever software that like, well, we have a, a document management software, was it open-ended or is it closed-ended? And so. And, and you want it to be. Say, so you want it to be. If you're the if you're the owner of the firm and you want the orderliness. And you want to make sure that that orderliness is in place, and that people aren't capturing, you know, hoarding rogue documents. Then you have to have a closed system because otherwise, people can save things, and they will. They'll say, "I don't want everybody else to be able to see this. So I save this." Now, all of a sudden, they're saving their, you know, a case they're working on, and then when they leave, if somebody else needs to work on the case. Where are those documents? Nobody knows. And I. That's the when that happens, those people usually call me a week later, and they're like the easiest sales to make because <laughs> it's like yes, we need a, a closed end document management system, and again, it just it's just to make people use it. So right, it's to take the thinking out of it. They don't have to think about is this a kind of document that needs to be in the system. The answer is yes. It needs, you know if it's a word document, it needs to be in the system, and you can select which kinds of documents. You can say if it's a PDF. You know, maybe not if you don't want PDFs, but you probably would. But you know, certain file types, like I don't know, Photoshop or something, you might go, "We don't care about that," so we're not going to force them to save Photoshop. So you can force it on an application basis, right? Right. So there, there are what we call hooks that we put into software programs. So Word, WordPerfect, still have WordPerfect, Excel, Adobe. You can choose to put those hooks in or remove them. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've put in hooks into AutoCAD. So when you're mm -hmm. in AutoCAD and you go to save the draft, World Docs or Net Documents can pop up. Right. And the other thing here, that if we look at this, is that we can make stuff mandatory. So we have to put in a client, we have to put in a matter, we have to choose a doc type. And you can choose. This is up to the firm. Right. Decide, okay, we want these three things mandatory and these two other things are optional. Mm -hmm. Now, just jumping to the, the open DMS, so if someone says they have an open DMS, that means that there's probably a, a macro in Word, and so if you go to hit, you have to have the user hit save and then choose that matter. Mm -hmm. So the user has to first save the document, Okay, in the normal place, and then have to come back here, and then choose where to save it to attach. Two mm -hmm. steps, and there's a choice in there, so it rarely gets done. Right. And, it, and again, the big example here is I was hitting save, just the window save. Like, and if I went to file save, this was popping. Here, there's an, a separate toolbar. This example is PC Law, where I have to then, you know have the option of choosing the saving. Right. And that's the thing is that, you know, it, chaos theory, you know, is in play because if anything can become chaotic, it will if you allow human beings to make choices or disregard things or get confused or whatever. And so you, I, I don't understand why anybody would choose an open DMS system. I mean, why even have a DMS system? Well, I, I completely agree. And so if you're, if you're, Oh, I, ask, I mean, I run into this every week. Is that someone, you know, wants practice management software? They're looking at something, and you find out what they really want is a document management software. Well, we're going to push them to a traditional document management software mm -hmm. because that's what they want. And and again, this this is okay, but it doesn't really. I mean, again, it gets. I don't want to say this because I, I know people that use this and it works, but after a while, it's just not scalable. Mm -hmm. Pricing so for World Docs is four hundred and twenty-five dollars a user, and then ninety-one dollars a year per user for technical support. But then you own the software, and you can choose to renew the technical support or not. The technical support also gives you any upgrades that come out. Okay. And, and I would say this about World Docs: they're really good about their tech support. It's all still done out of Jersey, so. Mm -hmm. You know, you might get a Jersey accent, but that's it. <laughs> um, but it's really, really good. Net documents, the most expensive 
uh, version net documents is $39 a user per month. The, the, there's one thing that I didn't add on here that you have to think about because World Docs has a cloud-based software as well. So they mm -hmm. have the traditional World Docs that you install on your server and they also have a cloud-based software. The hindrance to going online for document management is the amount of gigabytes or terabytes of documents that you might have. So this price could actually increase if you were to come up to them and say, well, I've got, you know, 500 terabytes of data I need in the system. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's the case, then um, it's probably going to be a little more expensive. Right. Well, obviously, they're running a cloud storage system. They have to charge you. They can't just give you unfettered access to store as much data. They have to, you know, limit it in some way. So, so what you're saying is they're pricing it based on how much data you store in the cloud right. on their servers. Right. Okay. So here I kind of want to, like, how do you choose what software? So this is, this is the thing that people are going to pull their hair out because, and I did, I pulled my hair out when I had to face this decision because I know when I was at the big firm we had, we had, um, we used Elite and Elite was really great, um, and it's you know for big firms. But we were the smallest of the big firms that had it, and so we were kind of like not priced in the right place. I mean, it was costing us a lot of money to have essentially a 747 when all we needed, you know, was a small private, you know, plane. And the problem is, once you've committed to one of these things, you'll never change. I mean, because it's just too much disruption. You know, nobody would ever visit it. You know, want make that choice. You, know, they, you wouldn't wish that on your worst enemy and you wouldn't do it yourself. So it, the, mom the moment where you're trying to decide which one should I get is agonizing because you, you instinctively sense that if you're disappointed a year from now, you're probably just going to live with your disappointment. Right. I mean, because you, you spent so much money getting that installed and it, right. it was a painful process. You don't really have that desire to so spend you're money again. So you're suggesting you should get demonstrations of each of these things. Now, these demonstrations are not going to be with your data. These demonstrations are just going to be demonstrations of how they work, you know, in general. Well, you know, that's honestly changed a little bit. So before, like three years ago, yes, you were just going to get a demo with, with sample data. Because cloud-based software is so easy to set up, you know, if I'm doing a, a, a NetDocs or a Clio demo, it's very easy for me to grab some of the data and just put it in there. Some real data. Some real data. The other thing about that on the demo is I can turn that basically over to the client to use as a free trial mm -hmm. for 30 days to see if they if if that actually works or not. But realistically, see, then the next problem kicks in because realistically, is any busy lawyer going to find time? To, not, to enter the time and do the same thing in both systems to test two of them, and they're certainly not going to do three. I mean, has it, have you ever found lawyers who actually do that? No, no. Okay, but, just, just checking. <laughs> but uh, but they their legal assistants, paralegals, office administrators, that's, they will. Oh, okay. And, and they're almost, because the lawyers are working, and... Mm -hmm. You know, working on their caseload and stuff like that. So this is really farmed out to them to make the decision. Got so, it. And usually I'll, I'll do one or two demos that are an hour long at most, you know, for the actual partners. Right. For lawyers in there. So, but I mean, you, you, for everything that you said, you need to get a couple demos just so you know. I mean, because it'll help educate you about what you're looking at. So I would get, you know, two to three because, like you said, this is a... The, throw away the money, it's a huge time suck, you know, especially right. if it's done wrong, it's something that you don't like, then it's going to really be wasting your time, and make right. everyone really unhappy. Um, make sure it integrates with your word processor, your billing and accounting software, your mobile devices. Um, you have to ask those questions. It's almost like think of everything that you use technology-wise. So I use Windows computers, I use Macs, you know, I have this type of scanner, I have 
Blackberries. These are all things that you know we're like, okay, well, we can't integrate with that, so this is not an option. Um, so you need to make sure. And then if you want to use a consultant, um, you can get a couple. You know, there's multiple consultants. You know, there's tons of consultants out there. You well, I would, let me just jump in and say I wouldn't use the word if. I would say when you use the consultant because I don't think. I mean, I, I'm sophisticated somewhat. I would never attempt to install or work on these things. Uh, Clio, Rocket Matter, Net, um, in my case, being exceptions. But I mean, the, the you know the Amicus is the World Docs. You're going to have to have a consultant for that. Right. So um, you can get several proposals um, that show software installation, training, and customization cost. Mm -hmm. uh, when I've been I've been generating proposals, I usually do a on-site and a remote install, and most people now tend to choose the remote install, just because people are just used to that now. Where you just log in and take over control, like you know, like a disembodied mastermind, and make everything run as though you were there. Right, and and the one thing I'd say, and on this slide, because we kind of already talked about most of the stuff, but. Free trials are a joke. That's not true. Um, it used to be true if it were something like, can I get a free trial of World Docs? Well, that's pointless. Right. <laughs> you got to pay someone to install it and set it up and, right. and free everything in there. And, you know, a consultant is not going to work for free to do that. So uh, the free trial are a joke if the software is being installed in your office. If it's not being installed in your office, um, then yeah, you can get it to work, and, and a lot of those software companies will help you just get some sample data in there, so you can see see how it, how it works. Right, and then the demo from the software company and from the consultant. What is that? How how does that benefit? Well, okay, I mean, I, well, I guess we're gonna record <laughs> record this, but I mean, um, like as a consultant, like I actually have to make you happy and, and do everything. Oh, oh, right. So yeah, no, I, I can do. Well, we, um, yeah, well, let me jump in so you don't have to say that because yeah. I'll, I'll just provide my perspective. I just I want to make sure I understood what the point was. Yeah, no, I mean, I, th I, I think that there are times when somebody, a lawyer will say, well, why do I need the consultant? I can just go to, to software companies. Software companies aren't really in a position to provide the same kind of support and attention and on the, you know, boots on the ground kind of insight that that um, consultants have. So if there is a consultant, the consultant is, it, using the consultant isn't usually going to cost you any more money than buying it from the software company. You're paying the same for the software, but you're going to get the benefit of somebody who cares more because they have to about whether that stuff works and whether you know how to use it, which is also incredibly important. Right. And, okay. and I mean, and really, the the, the trials and and. Well, the demos especially. So the demos are free. You know, we're going to do it. Any consultant's going to do a right. demo for free. Right. Okay, let's talk about integrations. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's no, again, the whole, one of the whole points is there's no one software that does everything well. If there was, I would rep it and talk about it all. Mm -hmm. uh, but there isn't. And I think a lot of people are like, are you kidding me? There's not? And I'm like, well, oh, not really. Um, so I always say look at, you know, take the best billing accounting software for you and link it to the best practice management or front office software for you. So and somebody then, says, I'm using QuickBooks. I love QuickBooks. That's what I use. Then you say, okay, well, that's going to determine what choices you have because not everything's going to integrate the same way with QuickBooks, although you said most of them do because QuickBooks is it's Yeah, QuickBooks, QuickBooks every, everyone really kind of does. But if it were, if it were something else like, um, you know, maybe net documents or something else. Mm -hmm. You would have to say, okay, well, you know, we have this. Well, actually, a lot of stuff that's good with net documents too. Um, but like, hey, like a meek, it's like, what is it? What is the billing and accounting software going to go into? I mean, this is a simple question. This is the easiest part. Do you have an integration with this? I'm mm -hmm. using World Docs and Amicus, and I need to add some billing and accounting software. What integrates? Mm -hmm. You know. And, that, and then you can easily you go to the website. They all have like an integration section right there. Right. But you have to you have to find that out. I mean, that's the first thing to find out, because then you can narrow the field right there. Word processor. That's the other thing. Is I'd say this is that. I mean, I still I still run a lot of WordPerfect out. 
Okay, so Word Perfect integrates with some software, but it doesn't integrate with everything. So that's always a question we ask. Um, internet browser. So does it work with IE or Firefox only, or does it work with other stuff? Um, email client. Does it work with Outlook? Does it integrate with Google Apps? So, for example, Clio integrates seamlessly with Google Apps, but doesn't integrate with Microsoft 365. Mm -hmm. right? Amicus Attorney integrates with Microsoft 365, but doesn't really integrate with Google Apps that well. That makes the decision right there. You know, mm -hmm. we're talking about what software to get. The one thing I'd say here on the mobile device, because we can kind of put this into it as well, is on there, is there a timekeeping app that works well? Mm -hmm. That's what most people want. Um, so do you have the ability to click on that device, not have to put in a complex password? That's a problem with a lot of these. Um, so, like, no one's going to put in a 10-digit, you know, uppercase, numbers, letters, password, to create a time entry. It's just... It's too much work. So, the, so, the, so there are separate apps, and I've seen these guys at the ABA Tech Show. I forget the names of some of them, but there's one of them um, that seemed prominent, which the guy showed me the demo. And basically, you'd enter your time, but it would push it into whatever time and billing system you used. Yeah, so that was probably iTimeKey uh -huh. from Bellfield, yeah, yeah. which is, is probably the best one. So, And I deal with that a lot. I use that personally. Mm -hmm. So if I walk into an office, I open up iTimeKeep and I start a time entry. When I walk out, I stop it. The beauty about iTimeKeep is that it works extremely well and it integrates with pretty much any billing and accounting software out there. Great. And so it saves you that having to enter the 10-digit password thing. Right. Because because a lot of these softwares, are, I'm not going to name any names here, but if you ask them, like, oh, yeah, we've got a mobile time entry um, ability, but you have to put in this complex password. Right. So, deal, deal killer. Right, exactly. And so, again, most legal software have integration with Outlook, but I would say they all have pretty much integration with Outlook. I would say almost all. Mm -hmm. Some of them have, I mean, a black, again, BlackBerry is really, and Windows Mobile, not really that important. I, I would say this, is that they all have iPhone apps. Okay? Every legal software that we talked about has an iPhone app. Um, they don't all have Android apps. I mean, that's changing as Android um, gets used more and more. Um, but like NetDocuments and WorldDocs all have iPhone apps. They still have the ability to access it from a Droid device, but you have to do it through the browser. Right. All right, well, we have about four minutes left, so can, maybe we should jump to the install time slide and kind of pick it up from there and see. Yeah. I think... All right, so, I mean, the, the way that an installation works on, this, on, on the process is you have a couple of meetings with your staff. You should have been given some sort of implementation guide that asks you for information. Like, fill out this information. Let's figure out how we are going to, um, you know, build the system for you. Because, again, everything is customizable, so what are your clients, what are your matters, what are your document types that you want moved over into the system. So that's what this, you know, what are your contact types. That's what these meetings are for. Mm. And then what you're going to do is you're going to plan for a rollout date, which will be usually like a Monday, and you'll be doing training. I put have, have, have a positive, productive attitude on here. I would say the way to do that again, is to have, and you're not going to get this for the attorneys, but for the staff, because they're going to be a huge part of this, mm -hmm. is they should all know what's going on, and really, I like to give the entire staff a demo before I have the rollout date, mm -hmm. just so that they don't feel like anything's being forced down upon them. Like, oh, right, at least they have an idea what's coming. <laughs> right, because I've run into those situations where they haven't. Um, mm -hmm. the, the training is really, really important, so plan for training, make it mandatory, you know, turn on the answering system, leave your smartphones outside. Um, you know, I, I tell you that the attorneys are always set up to go to training, and then they don't go, and then they think that, like, their paralegal is going to have to train them or their secretary, and then you end up having to train the person another time. Right. 
So that that really doesn't work well. So just go. I mean, we'll s schedule this out so there's a train that, you know, usually even for like a, a ten user farm, you'd probably have four trains such, just so that everyone would be able to do it. Basic training, two to three hours depending on questions. Advanced training, two to four weeks later, one to two hours. Basically, now that I've used the system, here are the questions that I have. Um, can you answer them? And then you know you're going to do some administrator power user training, which is usually about three hours. Right. And then you can always do training later on too. Like so, after a couple of you know months or maybe a year, you know, if you want to brush up or you want to make sure that some of the new people you know learn some things, training is ongoing. It's not just you know you train people, you say here it is, and you leave. Or right. or or, or you know, th and they can get training not just from you, but there are legal technology trainers that do this kind of thing, I guess specifically. There's a, there's, a, there's the consultants do it. There's legal technology trainers. There's right. YouTube videos. Right. There are the, the, the companies do the training. There's a lot of options out there. So right. there's really no excuse. Right. Um, and there's you know that's part of you if you hire a new user, they're going to need to go through some training. Right. Well, so this is this has been incredibly useful. I think you we've given a gr great overview to how these practice management systems work, some of the difficulties or challenges in figuring out which one is the best one for you and so forth. So I guess as a last thing that we want to leave people with, um, your company name is Optiable, which we showed up on the um, on your screen. And we, let's see, I don't know if you have your lower thirds up. You're looking a little dark there, but. Uh, Optibill is your company, um, and people can find you uh, there. And what else do we, they need to know? Um, yeah, we've got information on our blog and our website, um, some of the stuff that we talked about there. Um, Great. I think that's probably cool. the easiest way to find me. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing your insight with us today, Craig, and um, we will be in touch again soon, I'm sure. All right. Thank you so much. All right. You're welcome. Take care. Bye.